from Luke. First is Acts 3, 12 through 19. Peter saw his opportunity and addressed the crowd. People of Israel, he said, what is so surprising about this and why stare at us as though we had made this man walk by our own power or godliness? For it is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of all our ancestors, who has brought glory to his servant Jesus by doing this. This is the same Jesus whom you handed over and rejected before Pilate, despite Pilate's decision to release him. You rejected this holy righteous one and instead demanded the release of a murderer. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this fact. Through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name has healed him before your very eyes. Friends, I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance, but God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Now repent of your sins and turn to God, so that your sins may be wiped away. And then Luke 24, 36 through 48. And just as they were telling about it, Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them. He said, Peace be with you, but the whole group was terribly frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why do you doubt who I am? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's really me. Touch me and make sure that I am not a ghost, because ghosts do not have bodies, as you see that I do. As he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see, and he showed them his feet. Still they stood there doubting, filled with joy and wonder. Then he asked them, Do you have anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of boiled fish, and broiled fish, excuse me, and he ate it as they watched. Then he said, When I was with you before, I told you that everything written about me by Moses and the prophets and in the Psalms must all come true. Then he opened their minds to understand these many scriptures. And he said, yes, it was written long ago that the Messiah must suffer and die and rise again from the dead on the third day. With my authority, take this message of repentance to all the nations beginning in Jerusalem. There is forgiveness of sins for all who turn to me. You are witnesses of all these things. All right. Thanks, Kirk, for those readings. Uh, I've entitled the message, Two Keys to Understanding the Bible Today. This is not to, us, to propose that these are the only two keys to understanding the Bible, but they are two important ones, I think. Um, the Bible, as we know, is a massive library. It's not just one book. It's a library of ancient texts written across several thousand years uh, in several different genres in the Middle East, which is a f completely foreign culture to us, in several languages. So all these things uh, <laughs> working together make the Bible uh, a difficult text for us to understand. But with all these different attributes, the Bible does have a plot. There is, is, there's a plot to the story. So even though these are uh, separate books written by separate auth authors across uh, time and space and different genres, there is a discernible plot to the story. Uh, a meta-narrative is what we, a modern uh, name for that, meaning there's an overarching uh, purpose for the story. Uh, however, a lot of American Christianity especially has lost the plot. If you've been watching a show, like sometimes Vandy and I will be sitting and, and watching a show on TV and I'll read something on my phone or look at something on Facebook and then look up and realize I don't know what's going on <laughs> anymore. <laughs> I say, can you back that up <laughs> so I can catch up with what's going on in the plot? Uh, this is, I think, similar to what's happened with a lot of American Christianity. We've lost the plot. We've, we've lost the meta-narrative uh, of the Bible. And w when I'm using these, te these uh, videos by Pete Enns, he, he's getting to that same point, that if we, if we make the Bible, if we want the Bible to be something it isn't, then we can, cr we can use it to adopt all kinds of things that are really not in the overall plot or not, not important to it. Uh, this has happened gradually, I, th I think, over several centuries. Uh, 
Uh, most, of, most American Christians have never even heard the plot or the meta-narrative that the early church uh, believed about the Bible. Uh, you can go to Bible school, seminary, get multiple PhDs in theology or hermeneutics or homiletics, or, but, but if you don't understand the meta-narrative or the plot to the scripture, then you can, you'll either miss it or you'll substitute an alternative plot. And because the Bible is so diverse in its, in its genre and, and timetable and, and uh, authorship, we can, we can go to it and we can kind of create our own uh, meta-narrative or our own uh, plot. Or we can elevate subplots to the place of, uh, to, uh, you know, to, to uh, overdo the main uh, narrative or main plot. But I think these two texts that uh, Kirk read for us today can uh, put us on the, r- the right track, at least to staying within the guardrails of the plot that the early church embraced. That's to say there's some room between the guardrails, right? So, but I think it's important for us to f- identify the, some guardrails in the plot or the meta narrative so that we don't stray outside uh, those, those guardrails. Uh, guardrails. It's what the Bible calls the faith once delivered. In the epistles, you'll hear that phrase, the, the faith once delivered, and later the church calls it the apostolic witness. What, did the, what was the plot that the apostles intended to convey uh, to those early Christians? So our first text today from Acts 3 comes after the day of Pentecost. So it's a little bit out of sequence in the, in the church calendar here because we haven't got to Pentecost yet in, in the church calendar, but this comes after the day of Pentecost where Peter gives his first sermon. So Peter stands up, remember, the day of Pentecost gives his first sermon. Uh, this comes after that, after the day of Pentecost, and Peter and John are on their way to the temple to pray, and a- as they're on their way, they come across a crippled beggar. And you, you remember the story the crippled beggar is calling out to them. They say, silver and gold have we none, but, but in the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. So they, they heal this man, this crippled beggar, and crowds start following Peter and John, uh, understandably. Then Peter begins his second sermon. So this text from today is the second sermon of, uh, that we have recorded that Peter gave. And it starts this way in verse 12. You Israelites, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though he had decided to release him. So Peter now makes this reference to uh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We, We talked about this last week how Jesus used that text with the Sadducees who didn't believe in resurrection. Uh, he quoted it from the, the Pentateuch and in response to them not believing in the resurrection in, as a way of proving that resurrection uh, was a real thing because he said, God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He is the God of the living, not of the dead. Meaning, to God, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not dead. They're, they're alive. They were alive, they, they are alive, and they will be alive. So just a, a little reminder of what, how, what that phrase represents in Jesus' thinking, anyway. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and rejected in the presence of Pilate, though Pilate had decided to release him. Peter's pretty direct in his language here, in his f- second sermon. <laughs> but you rejected the holy and righteous one, and asked to have a murderer given to you, and you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. To this we are witnesses. So here in the second sermon that Peter gives, he sounds kind of like a prosecuting attorney in a courtroom. He's not mincing words. He's going right at this crowd that has been following him the same way that they followed Jesus when Jesus started healing people. But Peter now knows that crowds are very fickle. Peter now knows that the same crowds that followed Jesus uh, for the, the bread and the healings called out crucify him, uh, you know, not long after. So Peter has a firsthand experience with crowds and the crowd dynamic. So he goes right at this crowd uh, 
Sounds like a prosecuting attorney making his final argument in a courtroom. Uh, it sounds like bad news, the, his, the beginning of his sermon. A lot of churches today, if you started out with this, people would be leaving left and right, right at the beginning of the sermon, because they couldn't take it. Uh, if I were in this crowd listening to Peter, I'd be shaking in my boots, because he's saying, he's identifying this Jesus as the Messiah, and telling him, you guys killed him. You guys killed this Messiah that we've been waiting for for hundreds of years. He lays the blame, clear, you know, without question, on the crowd. The, the, but this is interesting because the crowd itself had not crucified Jesus. A few Roman soldiers actually did the crucifying, right? But Peter says, you are responsible to this crowd. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. So in the beginning of Peter's second sermon, God is not implicated in any way in Jesus' death. He is implicated in his resurrection, though. <laughs> now, at this time, there were many stories, uh, uh, mythological stories that these people would have been uh, familiar with about gods being uh, killed and then raised from the dead. Here's just three examples, and there are many. If you look up uh, ancient mythology, you'll find many, many more. Uh, Dionysus, Persephone and Tammuz were three mythological gods, all who had died and then rose again from the dead. Some of these were actually started as mortals, as humans, and then became gods through, their, uh, through what they suffered. Um, so some of these mythical go mythological gods suffered at the hands of other gods, some suffered at the hands of, of human beings, but they all suffered violent deaths and most of them came back with a vengeance <laughs> to get even for their, uh, their what's considered, they, they consider their unjust death. So when Peter identifies Jesus as the author of life and the holy and righteous one and as the Messiah, his audience, because of stories like this, had been preconditioned uh, to expect something bad from the one they had crucified. Because all these uh, cultural stories about gods being killed and raised from the dead uh, pointed to the God being angry when he comes back. They even had uh, an idea to support this from their own uh, Hebrew text. Remember when Moses was on Mount Sinai and he came down with the tablets and found the Israelites worshiping a golden calf, he ordered 3,000 of them killed. So he had been in the presence of God, comes down, and then, so, the, so the, you know, they had this preconditioning, this expectation that if they actually had killed the Messiah, the Messiah was going to be ticked. <laughs> And when he was raised, if he was raised again when this happened, he would come back uh, not in a good frame of mind for their sake anyway. But right here, after this really jarring open, opening to the second sermon, Peter shifts gears. It's like he's done this to get their attention. And you can imagine now the way I've described this, he's got their attention. If they're still listening, then... He has their attention. And he says this in the next verse. And by faith in his name, his name itself has made this man strong, whom you see and know, and the faith that is through Jesus has given him this perfect health in the presence of all of you. Wow. What a shift, huh? This is not anything like Moses. It doesn't sound anything like Moses coming down from Mount Sinai and finding people worshiping an idol. It couldn't be any more different than that. Remember, crippled beggars were considered cursed by God. They felt that God had done that to them. But this man was healed through faith in the name of Jesus, the very Jesus that this crowd Peter is speaking to, Peter says, was responsible for that Messiah's death. And he continues, And now, friends, <laughs> this is a big shift again. <laughs> now, friends, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. So Peter, the prosecutor, has now become the paraclete or the voice for the defense. He's, rather than accusing or pointing out what they had done, now he comes alongside them and says, friends, 
you did this in ignorance. So after clearly laying the responsibility on them, he comes in now and says, I know you did this, but you didn't know what you were doing. It harkens back to what Jesus actually said on the cross. Forgive them, Father, because they don't know what they're doing. So Peter takes up that same uh, uh, stream of thought as, as Jesus had uh, as he was dying. and says, you, d- you did this. That's right. You're responsible. All of you are responsible for calling out for the crucifixion of, of your Messiah, of our Messiah. But you didn't know what you were doing. To not know what you're doing is to act in ignorance, right? But once, once we have our ignorance revealed to us, we ought to be willing to learn something new, right? <laughs> we ought to be in a place where we are, we're willing to learn again. God the Father is not implicated in Jesus' death here. Peter points out that their own, scripture, their own scriptures foretell that the Messiah would suffer. So he says that in this way God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer. And it says in verse 18 that that ignorance would be what led them to crucify the Messiah. I know that you acted in ignorance as you rulers did also. Those are the people that actually ordered the, the crucifixion. In this way, God fulfilled what he had foretold through all the prophets. Now, some people read that and say, God wanted Jesus to suffer. God wanted him to die. And I don't think that's what he, Peter's saying. He's saying God just knew because of the way crowds act and because of the the false understanding of the Messiah that people had, that this would happen. That when he sent his son, they, out of their ignorance, would reject and crucify him. It's not saying that that's what God wanted to have happen, like he had some death wish that he had to get resolved through a penal atonement. Uh, He just knew what would happen. It's It's like telling your kids, don't touch that hot stove. And they go touch the hot stove I didn't want them to touch the hot stove. I warned them not to touch the hot stove, but I knew if they touched the hot stove, they'd get burned, right? That's, this is how to, to understand that, I think. And we can go on into verse 19. Repent, therefore, and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. So instead of divine wrath for their ignorance, all God is asking when he comes back is, is for them to repent and turn to God. So when Peter says turn to God, which is really what repentance means, to turn, to change the way you think, the assumption is they had not been facing God prior to this point, right? That's why they were ignorant. They weren't fight, they weren't, they didn't have a full, correct understanding of God. They were facing in a different direction. It's a metaphorical way of saying that they couldn't see God. They didn't understand God and that led them in their ignorance to do the unimaginable. They crucified their Messiah. But they did it in ignorance. These were people that were devoutly religious. They weren't, they weren't uh, pagans and you know, uh, evil people. They were just ignorant people. Even ignorant in their devout religiosity. They were people who knew their scriptures well. Among these people were Pharisees, Sadducees, scribes, chief priests, and so forth. People who were expert in the Jewish scriptures. So the first key of the two uh, keys to understanding the Bible in these texts today, I'm going to say it this way. Being an expert in the scriptures is no guarantee against ignorance. Being an expert in the scriptures is no guarantee against ignorance. Because many people in this crowd were expert in scriptures, yet they were ignorant of God. Another way you could say that is we need some humility in the way we handle the scriptures that if we're so proud and sure of ourselves, uh, we might just be not looking at God at all. The Hebrew scriptures had said, and Peter pointed out, that the Messiah actually would suffer, but the experts seemed to have missed that. They weren't looking for a suffering Messiah, they were looking for a warring Messiah, a Messiah who would, who would strike down their overseers. Isaiah 53 is a good example of a text about a suffering Messiah. I'll just read part of it here. So this, is, this might have been one of the texts Peter had in mind when he's saying, according to the scriptures, the, the Messiah would have to suffer. But they weren't looking for that. So let me just read a little bit of Isaiah 53. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? 
For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity, and as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. I mean, how accurate is that to the, to the crowd scene calling out for his crucifixion? Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God, and afflicted. It doesn't say that God struck him down. It says we accounted him. We thought that God was striking him down. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole. There's an interesting translation uh, quirk here. You could translate, but he was wounded by our transgressions instead of for our transgressions. By is a, an acceptable translation there. Uh, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before his shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. So it wasn't just what happened to Jesus. It was a perversion of justice what happened to him. Who could have imagined his future? <laughs> Isn't that an amazing statement? <laughs> By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? What was his future? Resurrection. <laughs> Who could have imagined that? <laughs> so I won't go on and read the rest. But read, read all of Psalm 53 sometime. It clearly identifies the Messiah as a suffering Messiah. So the second key to understanding scripture is in our next text uh, from Luke 24. We've just been in Acts 3. We'll shift to Luke 24. So this is after the resurrection, and Jesus appears to his disciples in Jerusalem uh, and says, while they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. So Jesus appears to them kind of like, <laughs> I don't know how, kind of just materializes there. He appears to them and they're struck with fear when he appears. So this is before our, our sermon from Peter, right? And Jesus said to them, why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your heart? They could have said, well, remember what happened to Tammuz and <laughs> Dionysius? <laughs> That's why we're afraid. Uh, well, remember what happened at, the Mount, at Mount Sinai and Moses came down? You know, uh, these are his disciples who had fled and left him alone to die. But he's trying to, to calm those fears because he knows it was out of ignorance that they had done all of that. Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. So Jesus is trying to convince them that he is not a ghost. That's a Gnostic idea, the idea that Jesus was some kind of a figment or an apparition. Uh, sometime, it, but it's important for us to recognize the apostolic witness of the New Testament and of the, the early church fathers is that Jesus was not an apparition. He wasn't a ghost, uh, even after his resurrection, that he was bodily raised from the dead. He has gone through death and come out the other side, but he still bears the scars of his crucifixion. This is really important. Two years ago, I, I did a message here, and I wrote a blog about that message called The Lordship of Wounds. Two years ago this week, I think. In the Gospel of John, after Jesus showed his disciples his wounds, it says they rejoiced when they saw the Lord. They didn't just recognize Jesus when they scar saw the scars of his crucifixion. They saw the Lord. Uh, or they started to understand his divinity through his wounds. When he showed them his hands and his feet, it says they saw the Lord. See, before that, they weren't sure what they were seeing. They thought it might be a ghost. They it, but when they saw his wounds, it's not like, oh, you're Jesus. I, I, I see. No, they saw his lordship. They saw his divinity in his wounds. 
They rejoiced when they saw that the lordship of Jesus was found in his wounds, not in his weapons. Hmm. Then Jesus reminds them of something. Then he said, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. So Isaiah was one of the prophets that Jesus is talking about here. Isaiah prophesied about a Messiah who would suffer, a Messiah who would be wounded, but who would not wound others. So Jesus is here starting to correct the ignorance that led them and the crowd that surrounded them to call for his crucifixion. He's reminding them not to exclude the parts of their scriptures that described what they would see as a weak and suffering Messiah. Because on Palm Sunday, when we, when we remember Palm Sunday and the people calling out Hosanna, Hosanna, and laying down palm branches, that's a clear allusion to the Maccabean revolt where Judah Maccabeus rode in and, and violently took back the temple. That's what they were hoping this, that Jesus would be, that kind of a Messiah, but he, he would not cooperate. <laughs> he wouldn't be that kind of a Messiah. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. That's such a key verse. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. So we can't understand the scriptures apart from this realization that even though in ignorance we killed the Messiah, God doesn't hold that against us. He knows that we did it in ignorance. God raised Jesus from the dead, not so he could come back and pour out wrath on us for what we had done. He raised Jesus from the dead so that we could repent and be forgiven for what we were ignorant about. Let me say those two phrases again. God raised Jesus from the dead, not so he could come back and pour out wrath on us for what we had done. Also, he didn't raise Jesus from the dead just to say there, I've got this wrath off my chest because I've poured it out on my son. That's the common penal view. He raised Jesus from the dead so that, he, so that we could repent and be forgiven for what we were ignorant about. Then we can take this message throughout the world. It's what we call the Great Commission, right? So Jesus couldn't give his disciples this commission until they understood what they had been ignorant about. If ignorance left, led to his crucifixion, then Jesus needs to correct that ignorance before he can set them free to go out and take uh, the gospel to the world. Otherwise, they'll be taking the wrong gospel. They won't be taking the right thing. So from my blog two years ago, here's just a paragraph. Jesus couldn't commission the disciples to carry on the work he had begun until they understood the kind of Lord he was until they understood that Jesus' lordship was embodied in wounds, not weapons, he could not send them into the world. If he had, they would have gone about trying to advance the kingdom of God with coercion and violence. Now, though, they are ready to be sent in the same way that the Father sent Jesus. In John, he says, now I send you in the same way God sent me. Right? So they had to understand how God sent Jesus first before God could then uh, before Jesus could then send them into the world he had to get this all sorted out he had to resolve their ignorance because their ignorance is what led to them completely uh, misunderstanding him and either calling for his crucifixion or in the disciples case just fleeing leaving him alone to uh, to suffer and die without them so that leads me to the second key and how we understand the scripture Jesus is the Lord crucified and the Lamb slain. Not was, but is. He is the Lord crucified and the Lamb slain. Let me explain what I mean by that. In addition to keeping a humility about our grasp on Scripture, that's point number one, we have to temper all of our Bible study with the fact that Jesus is the Lord crucified, and the Lamb slain. In Revelation 13, we read, 
he is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. What does that mean? I think it, it's very simple. I think it means he's always been the same. He's always been the lamb slain. Some people try to apply all kinds of metaphysical interpretations to that verse. I think it's just simply saying, this Jesus that we crucified has always been the pr kind of Lord that would allow himself to be crucified in order to reveal our ignorance. <laughs> You're like he's always been that way. God didn't change between the Old and the New Testaments, in other words. But our understanding of God is meant to change <laughs> because Jesus is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This is how God has always been. I love how Brian Zahn puts it. God is like Jesus. God has always been like Jesus. There has never been a time when God wasn't like Jesus. We didn't always know this, but now we do. It's such a succinct way to, under, to, to put it, that Jesus comes to uncover and heal our ignorance about God. When he showed his disciples the scars of his crucifixion, the scars had healed, but they hadn't disappeared. Why would God leave the scars in the body of Jesus? Obviously, they were healed. He wasn't bleeding out. He, w he was standing there in front of them, and they were, they were healed wounds, but they, were, they hadn't disappeared. He carries the wounds of what we did to him even now, but he's not seeking vengeance. He's speaking peace to us. So to understand the Bible, we must keep the Lord crucified and the Lamb slain firmly in mind. The Lord crucified and the Lamb slain are a key, a cipher, if you will, that makes it possible for us to understand which characterizations of God are legitimate and which are our own pro, uh, projections of our ignorance onto God. Let me read that again. I have just one more quote uh, and we'll uh, wrap up. To understand the Bible, we must keep the Lord crucified and the Lamb slain firmly in mind. The Lord crucified and the Lamb slain are a key, a cipher, if you will, that makes it possible for us to understand which characterizations of God in the Bible are legitimate and which are projections of our own ignorance about God onto God. I have just a, a one slide quote from uh, James Allison, who's a Catholic theologian, so he's going to refer to the Catholic uh, uh, theology here, but I think it's still applicable. About this, here's Allison speaking. Now I insist on this, since it is the central pillar of the Catholic faith. From the presence to the disciples of the risen victim, the crucified one risen as crucified, he was risen as crucified, the lamb triumphant as slaughtered, everything else flows. Without that insight, nothing unfolds, no clear perception of God, of grace, of eternal life, about what we must do or how we must live. So Allison goes so far to say that unless we keep cognizant of the Lord being the crucified one risen as crucified. He's, the scars are still there to remind us that he, has, he was the crucified victim. His scars are still there so that we remember that he is the lamb who was triumphant as the slain lamb, as slaughtered. He goes so far as to say Without that insight, nothing unfolds, no clear perception of God, of grace or eternal life about what we must do or how we must live unfolds. So he's saying this is really central to understanding uh, God and understanding the Bible. That if we, if we lose the grasp of the Lord crucified, the lamb slain, we're easily led down other rosy paths that might appear to, uh, appeal to our ignorance about God that ultimately can lead us to very bad places, very uh, lead us to places that God wouldn't take us, right? 
So the two keys to understanding the Bible in these two texts, I've put this way. Being an expert in the scriptures is no guarantee against ignorance. And Jesus is the Lord crucified and the Lamb slain. We mustn't turn Jesus, the Lord crucified and the Lamb slain, into a Rambo figure, (laughs) which a lot of the church has done. You can't turn Jesus into a Rambo figure and, and simultaneously remember that he is the Lord crucified and the lamb slain. He, they recognized his lordship in his wounds, not in his weapons. Right. Acts says, too, that Jesus will return in the same way that he left. He didn't leave breathing fire and slaying anybody that was in his, in his eye, uh, eye shot or ear shot. He left with love and without vengeance. So I guess my question to start discussion today is can these two keys help us stay true to the plot, help us to stay true to the meta narrative, or can, or can they help us, as we look at different scriptures, identify if those scriptures are central to the plot or if they're a competing uh, sub narrative or subplot that is in competition with and in opposition to the main plot and the main uh, meta-narrative of the scriptures. I think it's really important because otherwise you just end up considering it it all uh, part of and equally uh, valid in in the story. So what do you guys have to say about that today?